Welcome to B Cafe. Uh, we have with us a special guest today, the global chairman and CEO of Nielsen, David Kenny. Welcome to the show, sir. Delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Just for a quick introduction, uh, David, in his previous avatars, has been with IBM. He's been with the Publicis Group. He's been with Best Buy and also the Weather Channel. Uh, so if I can start off with a kind of light question, how does the climate look like in the research business these days? The, the good thing about uh, the research business is people need it at all times. And, and particularly when the consumer is changing is when you need the most insight as to how she's changing. And a lot is changing right now in the, in the global consumer and in the Indian consumer. So uh, there's a, a big demand for what Nielsen does. Okay, and in an era where, you know, it's moved from third party data to second party data to first party data, I also read in the Harvard Business Review that it's soon going to be no party data. How is this going to impact research as a business? I think that we've got so much more data now um, that it can become overwhelming. What it means for us as a researcher is that our role is to bring that back to people because data tends to measure data from machines, to bring that back to people, to make sure that we're putting all the right data on the same person and that we understand the whole person. The other thing with all the first party data is you know a lot about your customers when they're interacting with you. You can become blind to what your customers are doing when they're not with you, and that's dangerous. So again, it creates real opportunity and requirement for Nielsen to help people understand what folks are watching when they're not watching. My platform. You know, uh, connecting that to trends with consumption of media globally. Yes. What are some, you know, big uh, trends that you see happening in maybe 2023 and beyond? I, I think part of what we're all looking at at media, because media has always served this very important societal role to bring people together, to have common experiences, to have shows we talk about. What we're finding is much more of entertainment is viewed on demand and is far more fragmented. And so there are less opportunities to create big movements of society together. Probably the one thing that continues to grow is sport. And so we see around the world a growing value in sport as the media event that truly unites everybody and brings them together in an exciting way. And so um, for brands, for sponsors, understanding sport, making sure that uh, people know how sport fits into their plans is, is probably the big thing we've seen going on in 23. Does that also imply that the production of sports content is going to become more expensive than any other form of entertainment? It certainly looks that way. Um, and was it always like that, if I may uh, ask you? Sport value has been going up over time, but I would say the differential value of live events that bring people together, because there are less of them, makes them more important. And uh, and from your standpoint, are you seeing that the return on investment on live events is kind of outperforming pre-recorded or other forms of entertainment? Uh, people are still consuming all entertainment. So I, I, I would say we're also seeing great returns on on entertainment, but it's it's in a different form because it tends to be watched a little bit more on demand. Um, but uh, it's, still, it's still very important to engage people. P people are watching as much television as ever right now. Um, and in some ways, they're getting more out of it because they're watching things that are really relevant to them. They're having a lot more control over the experience. I was also kind of reading, I may get the numbers wrong, but uh, a significant percentage of viewing in the US is now on streaming devices, right? Uh, about 28 or 30 percent? If yeah, not it's, more. it's a yeah. little over 30 now. Yeah. Uh, so does that mean that it's cut into a viewership or readership of other forms of media or has the total time spent on entertainment slash news slash information gone up? It's gone up a little bit. Um, the one thing that's true is that none of the technology created time. Every person only has 24 hours a day. So the, the places you have to go for growth are, first of all, where the population's growing, which is why India is more important than ever to so many brands and so many companies because it's a growing population. The US does not have a growing population. It's a flat population. But whether you're in India or the US or Europe or Africa, 
Every human being has 24 hours a day. They have to commute, they go to work, they have to eat. So their time spent on media tends to be pretty level. Um, you, you mentioned the US, we see around the world about four, four and a half hours a day with television or video content is about the max. So isn't that what Mark Zuckerberg is trying to correct by saying that you can use your time more efficiently in a, in that metaverse that <laughs> uh, where you could the, probably telecommute? Theoretically. Well, yes, and we've all learned to do more hybrid working and commuting time has certainly been cut for most office workers anyway, um, not so much for other categories. So there are ways to be more efficient using technology. But that doesn't necessarily all turn into more media time. The, the one thing we're watching in media is people multitasking, uh, reading, their, reading something on their phone and watching something on their television at the same time is, uh, is certainly something we need to watch and make sure we understand what, where the attention is actually going. So that's bad news for brands in a way, right? It's, because it's, it's, it's no longer undivided attention. Uh, it's certainly more complicated, yes. Not necessarily bad news, but uh, <laughs> you've got to take it into account. What are some interesting strategies that are at play to kind of work around this thing about multitasking? Well, in terms of the measurement, uh, we're fortunate to have engaged panelists, including and, you know, here we have a special panel just on smartphones, which has been very helpful in India. Um, and what we're learning from those panelists is where do they really focus their attention so that we can attribute um, of that time where they're actually focused when both signals are going on in the household at the same time. No, the other part of the entire media landscape is the rise and rise of fake news. And um, how is research kind of, or how can research potentially help in clearing the field of all this uh, yeah. and ensure a constant flow of authenticity? It's a tricky one because uh, not, not everyone agrees on what news is fake and what news is not fake. And so uh, I, it's not black and white. I, I can research things like demographics, time spent. These are knowable. Um, is the news validated? Is it properly researched? Does, did it go through an editorial uh, review board? Did it have multiple sources? All the important things that have governed journalism forever. Um, are hard to determine from research, but we are at least trying to understand, did the consumer believe it to be true? And uh, do news organizations want to hold themselves to a certain level of editorial standard? We would like that because then at least you could put a, a quality marker on content to understand what is really news content and what is really opinion content. Um, and I think advertisers would really like that. Unfortunately, without that, it's all assumed to be fake news. It's all assumed to be opinion. Um, and I think there's been a fall off in some of the marketing and advertising adjacent to news for that reason in the world, which just exacerbates the problem because that hurts the economics. So we, we would like more proof points of what news can be trusted in order to have trusted advertising and trusted measurement from Nielsen all work together to build a strong media ecosystem, and particularly a strong journalism ecosystem. The other part of this debate is that, you know, measurement and media, there are always these kind of, um, I shouldn't even say healthy tips, but yes, there is, it's always been a sore point in media, right, measurement. How have you kind of been able to bring the balance back around the world? People always blame the referee, right? <laughs> in any yeah. sport, and, and measurement is the referee. Yeah. Um, the reason World Cup is an example. Uh, exactly, so, but it is our job to be the referee. And uh, so therefore my focus is making sure we're continuing to innovate to prove that we have the best, most robust measurement. Um, because there will be changes and that will create sheer gainers and sheer losers. To have trust in that, you need to have uh, a lot of in innovation around it. We, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this every year. Um, in, in 2022, we were actually, we rose 20 points where we had over 300 patents. So we're the 180th most uh, producer of patents in the world uh, of all companies. And I think this is something I'm very proud of. So it shows we continue to have intellectual property that really does the best job of measurement. Um, and that way, even when there are arguments, you can go back 
as any good referee would and say, here are the rules. Here's how we measured against the rules. Here's how we did that better than anyone else. And here were the, you know, three new innovations that helped us do it better. Um, so you, you went on the facts. And uh, if I could maybe use that referee anecdote, is the absence of the referee the end of the game? I think, I think that without rules, um, you really lose trust. Um, and you and you really start to devolve. You, by analogy, um, fake news was, I think, a relaxation of editorial standards um, that caused people to, it, it, the whole thing just started to unwind. And then you, you really see the whole system break. Um, if that were to happen in, in measurement, audience measurement, I think it would be very bad for the industry because it would just, you, you wouldn't have anything to go on other than people's self-reported numbers. And we know there would be problems in that. Okay, the other point that I want to bring about is that the rise and rise of algorithms and how content creation is kind of putting itself into a formula. How good or bad is it for the future of media? Algorithms are helpful to better understand what someone might love. And, and I think this is important for creating more you know, bespoke content. So I, I have a long history in algorithms in my career, as you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. It, they can be useful. But you can never completely see to the algorithm. You can't, you know, great content is created. <laughs> you need to have a creative process uh, to be able to do that. Um, and, and quite honestly, I think the consumer wants to be surprised. Yeah, to explore the unexplored, right? Otherwise, um, everything would become a formula. And it's, uh, it's even in the streaming world, it, uh, in a number of countries, we've seen the growth of the fast model, which is basically, it's a, it's a program channel, even though it's streaming. If we look at some of the YouTube behavior where people stay on autoplay and have suggestions that keep them engaged, it's working. So um, I, I do believe uh, finding new content is key when you don't make the algorithm, when you use the algorithm as directional as opposed to, you know, absolute. What are your views on the monetization of media moving forward? Because as we have seen, going this way or that way has both been counterproductive. Like Netflix has taken a few steps back from a purely subscription model. There are others who are advertiser driven who are now actively looking. So the consumer only has so much time and so much money. And, and because the consumer has so much time, I, I think she prefers less ads, not more. Um, and I think even ad sponsored platforms have to reduce their inventory to make their shows watchable. That increases the value, the scarcity value, um, which is super important and why you've got to measure it because it's, it's <laughs> you got to get it right at those price points. On the other hand, you know, advertising does make content more affordable. It brings more people in. Some people are going to be willing to give up some of their time to take messages, particularly messages that are relevant to make it work. So I, I think you do find we will come to a place with less edge units that are more valuable, but spread across more platforms. So I think it kind of levels out uh, uh, to some extent. This does mean it'll be more precise that the, the cost per thousand, they, the, the unit price on advertising will go up because the scarcity goes up, um, which is all the more reason to be really precise about who you reach to really have that measurement work well, to really make the attribution models work so that people get a return on that. Brilliant. And final question. Uh, we are in this phase where, you know, they say that every brand is a potential media house because of the audience that they have cultivated through their social channels and so on. We are also in a world where they say that every brand is also a potential research hub because of the data that they are collecting. Do you feel that in the future we are going to have a world where there is no large media or large research hub because of the disaggregation? No, certainly on the research side, I think that uh, it's uh, what's not fragmenting is people. And so the, but you're uh, not so confident about the media side. Well, I want to come back to that. <laughs> on the research side, you need to aggregate in order to fully understand the person. And so um, I think it changes, and I think we have to be humble that the data sources will be from multiple sources, not just our panel, but that panel is the true set and the validation set that allows that all, day, all that data to talk to each other so you get a total view of the person to serve them. Now I go to the media side, the, 
the big media companies need to use that research to uh, serve that audience and the scale ones will be those that do it. What is clear is distribution is key. People cannot manage through too many platforms. And so those who really know how to use that data and that research to give consumers what they want will be aggregating the others. Um, in the end, it's all going to be driven by who has the best understanding of the total person. Amazing. On that note, thank you very much for joining us at the Bee Cafe. It was such a lovely Delighted chat. to be here. Thank you for having thank me. Thank you.